before I actually begin the service, I want to give a, a little PSA, public service announcement. Whatever time you are thinking of leaving the services before the services themselves are actually finished, as to say, if you are thinking, although as soon as the rabbi's sermon is done, or although it's 12 o'clock, or although it's 12 15, add 15 minutes to that. Uh, add 15 minutes, I promise we will charge you more if you stay a little longer. And you may find something that you didn't expect to find. In fact, that's the only way you can find something you didn't expect to find, is to change your plan at the last minute. Alright, so 15 extra minutes, but whatever you thought you were going to leave, see what you discover, and just stick around that extra little bit. And now we'll return you to your regular scheduled sermon. <laughs> so now we'll go. 17 years ago, every rabbi in the country had to rewrite their sermons. 17 years ago, it's about a week before Rosh Hashanah, this time of the year, on uh, September 11th. And every rabbi in the country could no longer just give whatever sermon they already had prepared after the tragedy of 9-11 had occurred. I was spared that particular problem because I was a first-year rabbinic student. I didn't have a congregation that was looking to me to leave them during that time period. And in fact, being on the West Coast in Los Angeles, when I woke up on September 11th, I staggered out of bed, got myself more or less presentable for humanity, and took my colleagues to fill and began to head down for the meeting in the chapel, having no idea of what was going on. And as I stepped out of my door, my neighbor, who is another um, student, opened her door suddenly, which was unusual. She didn't usually get out that early. And she said, have you seen the news? No. She invites me into her apartment, and she has her TV on. And as we are watching, the second plane goes in to the second tower. I go back to my apartment and wake up Penelope. And we sit and we watch the events unfold of that morning. And after the second tower has fallen and after the dust has cleared, what do you do? Our day had just begun out in California at that point. And this tragedy had already hit us. Well, it was about time for class at that point. So I went down to class. Went down the steps from the apartment at the top of the uh, University of Judaism down to the campus. And there was my professor, Dr. Khan, for Mishnah class. And there were most of our other students. Those who had family and friends in New York were still busily trying to tell if everyone was okay. And Dr. Cohen, the professor that I had for mission, he said, what did you do when we have tragedies? We study. It's what you do. It's the Jewish response. When there is a tragedy, and you're not one of the first responders, you're not one of the people on the front lines, you open the Torah. You open the Mishnah. You open the Talmud. You open Talatah. You open Kabbalah. Whatever it is that you need, you study. This is the same as he said for 3,000 years. For every tragedy, we learn. For every heartbreak, we learn. Why? He said, because first, we need to understand why these things are happening. And the only way we're going to understand that is to understand why this, this universe, happens. And more, we need to understand how to prevent these things from happening and how to fix the damage that has been done. And you can't make that decision by just running off into this night, shouting and screaming your anger and pain and your grief. You have to understand what God wants us to do in these situations. And that means you have to study. And so we study. And I'll tell you that being in that room, full of other Jews, studying Jewish texts that have supported Jews for 3,000 years, it was incredible. I mean, there was nothing I could do 
about what was happening in New York and Washington and in a field in Pennsylvania. But this, at least, not only gave me the idea that there was something we could do to prevent a repeat, but that I was among people who cared. And I was among people who shared the same values and ideas and the same passion that I did to prevent this. Being part of Am Yisrael, people of Israel, not just for these students, but all of the people of Israel. This is something that has been drilled into me from a very early age. And at different points in my life, it has come back for a very powerful reminder. Sitting there on September 11th, studying Mishnah was one of the most powerful. Standing on a train platform in Paris when I was much younger, and a busker on the other platform, having seen my Pita, began to play Hava Nehila, was another powerful moment to recognize that he recognized me in the middle of one of the most foreign and that particular point on friendly cities to me. I loved all the other European cities much more than I did Paris. But to know that there was a lot of men on that other platform. And even though there was a book for you, I wasn't going to throw a prank, this was even before the Euro, all the way across the platform to them, but just to say, I see you. You're one of ours. You're one of mine. We're together. Incredibly. Most recently, we were in Japan for, for our vacation, revisiting where Penelope and I worked and where we lived. And my daughter falls in love with a clothing store in one of the little shopping districts near our hotel. We, we, we spent a lot of men in that store. <laughs> and it turns out, as we are going up to the cash register to pay, this is an entirely Israeli line of clothing. <laughs> so we go all the way to Tokyo so my daughter can buy Israeli clothes. <laughs> but the feeling of having been part of buying Israeli clothes in Tokyo <laughs> made it even better than just knowing my daughter had found something that she liked and that was special and that would be treasured from her trip to Japan. Knowing that I was participating in helping the factory in Israel and the artists in Israel who had designed these clothes was an incredible view. Time and time again, no matter where we go, I saw them say all the time, I am reminded of the Jewish people. People will come up to me either because they know I'm Rabbi Yuli or because they see the Kitab and they know I'm Jewish. And conversation after conversation, events after events, meeting after meeting, they, there will always be a reminder that I am part of Am Yisrael, that I am part of the Jewish people. And yet, there are voices now that say, maybe that's not such a good thing. I'm not talking about the voices of assimilation. I'm talking about the voices that say, tribalism. And when they say it, their nose does that little wrinkle thing. The seer, tribalism, chauvinism, groupism, divisive. Right after 9-11, I'm sure all of you remember, our entire nation felt united. Felt like we were one people. Much as I hope that we feel that way about our fellow Jews. And we know that that did not last so long. And so people began to look for things to blame. And one of the things they began to blame was tribalism. Exclusionary groups. Identity politics. As though somehow believing that you belong to a group makes you less likely to be humane to other people of other groups. And some of you may be even thinking, well, actually, yes, and that's true. Doesn't the truth that as soon as you say us, you make it them? And as soon as you make it us, you are putting yourself almost in very less or very self loathing on a pedestal higher than the best. That somehow, by drawing a line around one circle of people, you are drawing an arrow down upon the rest of the world. And the tribalism, the chauvinism, and therefore Am Yisrael is one of the causes of all the woes that our country, our world is face. And as people begin to focus on their groups, we should let go of our identity 
I see members of the tribe. We should let go of being on Israel because when we do, we're only looking down on the rest of the world. We only divide the world. What kind of horrible nation, what kind of horrible people would somehow take solace, would somehow take comfort, would somehow take pride in being part of a group just because they were born into it? Or because they chose to convert them into it, and now they are part of some universal lump that is separate from the rest of the universe? Every kind of people needs that. Find me a person who does not have a tribe. Find me a person who has no group, a person who has no loyalty, no allegiance to anything but themselves. And I will tell you, you will have found a narcissistic loner. A person who, despite their protestations, that I am merely making myself be free. I am merely exercising my liberty. I am just an individual. And therefore, I owe no allegiance to anything. I owe no loyalty to anyone. Save myself and my voluntary associations of the moment. And that person has within them the deeds of sociopath. Because they are unwilling to ever allow themselves to be bent, to be pinched, to be inconvenienced by something other than just what they momentarily think they want. A person who lacks empathy for anyone else besides themselves, or those who they deign to be kind to for the moment, because it pleases them, because they freely give their love to death. Being a moral human being is not about freely giving your love today, it's about giving your love when it doesn't feel free, when it hurts, when it inconveniences you. How many of you had to choose to give up a vacation day to come here on the second day of Rosh Hashanah or the first day of Rosh Hashanah and are already lamenting that your vacation this year is going to be much shorter because all the holidays fell on weekdays? Well, the fact that you're here already answers much many of those questions for me. Or maybe you didn't have vacation days, but still you know that because you're self-employed, your business will not be bringing in what it should be bringing in. Were you to be behind the desk and at the computer today? Or were you to be out in the field doing your job? But you knew that it's important to be here. Because you have a loyalty to our faith and our people and our traditions. Because you have a connection to the people in this room. And that is not a bad thing. That is not chauvinism. That is the beginning of building a heart. The reason why we have these groups, and why groups are not the antithesis of love and empathy for others, but instead the incubator, is because we, because we are in this room, and I know that any one of you would help me change a tire if you could, just because I'm a Jew. Any one of you would help me if you saw me on the side of the street, and said, wait, I, I know you, you're from my synagogue, what's wrong? What do you mean? Because I know that, and because you know that about me, I can be at peace in this room. I can trust this room. And I know that you can be at peace and you can trust me. And that is when we allow ourselves to be open, to truly begin to care about other people. It's what sociologists will call social capital. I, I have invested in this group by making sacrifices. By choosing to be here rather than there. By choosing to give up this, even though it disappoints me. Whatever the decisions you have made that led you to this room, everyone else in this room recognizes you made those decisions just like they did. And therefore, they can rely on you. To be a similar temperament, to be a similar value, to be a similar goal. And that means, together, we do not have to be constantly suspicious of one another. We don't have to look over our shoulders to see if somebody is freeloading on the goodness of our community, because you've already proven your worth to the community just by willing to be part of the community. Now I can trust you. Now I know that you belong to me and I belong to you. I'm just right. Because I know that, because I know I have this space and I have this people, now, now I have a fortune. And not a fortress to defend myself from all of the evils of the outside world. Oh, it does a pretty good job of that, too. But I have a fortress from which to make sorties out into the world. Out into ex 
extending that hand of friendship. Because if I know that I am linked to a million hands over here, then I can extend one hand out and try to befriend somebody who I don't yet know is part of my soul. Who I don't yet know what that relationship will be. I can be kinder to the stranger because I know that you love me and I love you. And by doing so, I can turn that stranger into a friend. This is why Jews have become such good citizens of the United States. Because we were able to associate freely and to live in peace, we were able to then extend ourselves in peace to the rest of the nation and to become members of society in good standing who serve their communities in every capacity. And because we do that, we have seen what a wonderful thing this United States can be when it is truly united. When we recognize that, yes, we are Jews, and we are citizens, and we are citizens with all of our fellow citizens. So that as I drive down the road and I see somebody who isn't familiar to me, I nevertheless know he's one of me. He's an American. She's American. They're here. That means I have a connection to them. They have made a decision to be in this land. Therefore, she and me, we share this. There is still an arm that is implied simply by being together within the same space. Now that's a riskier reach. And it only works if we have this arm to rely upon. If we know that we have our safe house, our baby nest, our house of assembly, then we know that we can reach out beyond the borders of the house. But if you feel you have no place that is safe, that is connected, that you simply will go through life picking and choosing the winners and losers of your affection, of your kindness, or of your anger, and have no place to sit your anger. And once we recognize that within our nation that we are united, then we can take the next step and say to the world we are united. We are all the Adam. We are all brought from the first human. The Midrash asks, why did God bother to make Adam Rishon a first human being? Why not make a whole bunch of first human beings? It's a much better way to jumpstart the world. And if you look, all of the other animals, nowhere does it say, and God made Zebra Rishon, the first zebra. And from that zebra, all the other zebras came. Or the first fish, or the first bug, the first lion. None of the other animals are described in such a way. Only humanity is described as coming from a single source. And the Midrash says this was absolutely intentional by God to draw our attention that no one should ever say, my ancestors are superior to yours. My people are greater than yours. Because how could you? We all come from the exact same seed. But it's hard to always remember that when you see somebody who looks different than you, who speaks differently than you, who perhaps has a different culture than the one you're used to. You don't share the same social capital as you do with Am Yisrael, where we are, all know when we should rise and when we should sit and when we bow and when we don't. For the people that are bowing in ways that we're not used to, that makes me a little uncomfortable. For the people that eat things different than me, that makes me a little uncomfortable. For the people who perhaps seem to have different values in me, that makes me a little uncomfortable. But they are still the Neadam, they are still the children of that first human being. Just as we are. And because we have the security of this place, and because we have the knowledge of our country, of how beautiful it is when we recognize the shared United States that belongs to all of us, and our commitment to each other because we are part of it, then we should also have the courage and the strength to extend our acceptance and our understanding of all around the world. On Israel, the idea of being part of the Jewish people is not the root of evil. It is not divisive. It is not chauvinistic. Unless someone decides they want to make it that way. 
The notion of there being a Jewish people is meant to be our rock upon which we build, not in which we hide. God has given us this great gift, and the fact that we are here together shows that we appreciate this blessing above all the other things that you could be doing on this Tuesday morning. And if we can keep that spirit, and if we can trust in that spirit, then we will always be able to remember what our people have felt for 3,000 years, that they opened the same books, shared the same feelings, and shared their life with the world. If we do that, no other buildings need to fall. Shabbat Shalom. Shut up.